I want to talk about the Allais paradox. Now, in 1953, Maurice Allais, a French economist who won the Nobel Prize in 1988 uh, in economics, publishes a paper that contradicts the expected utility hypothesis. And it's based on a number of experiments that he conducted. And, you know, this is inconsistent with rational behavior. And the most common way we show this is by looking at the following two gambles. Um, the gamble, or sometimes in economics, we call these lotteries. The gamble between A and B, and a second set between C and D. So in the first case, in the gamble A, there's a 100% chance of receiving a million dollars. And in gamble B, there's a 10% chance of receiving five million, plus an 89% chance of receiving a million, plus a 1% chance of receiving nothing. Now, if you had the choice of those two gambles, which one would you take? Then think about it, and we'll come back to that. Let's look at the second set between C and D. Here, there's an 11% chance of getting a million dollars and an 89% chance of getting nothing. In gamble D, there's a 10% chance of getting five million plus a 90% chance of getting nothing. And again, think about your choices. Which one would you prefer? Now, what people have found in numerous experiments, not just by Allais, but by other um, experimental economists, is that people tend to prefer A to B and D to C. And what we want to ask ourselves is, are these choices consistent with one another? All right, let's take a look at the expected values of A and B. The expected value of A is 100% of a million dollars, so the expected value is a million. In the case of B, the expected value is 10% times 5 million, plus 89% times uh, 1 million, uh, plus 1% times 0. So it turns out to be 1.39 million. So if someone chooses A over B, they are presumably maximizing expected utility, not expected value. Because if they were maximizing expected value, they would choose B. And so we can write that as the utility of $1 million is greater than the utility received from 10% uh, of the utility received from receiving $5 million, plus 89% of the utility received from receiving $1 million, plus 1% 1 of the utility times the utility of receiving nothing. All right, let's take a look at uh, how C and D look. What are the expected values? Well, the expected value of C is 11% uh, times 1 million plus 89% times 0, so it's 110,000. Um, for D, it's 10% of 5 million plus 90% of 0, or 500,000. So here, if someone chooses D over C, they're presumably maximizing expected value. So if you cho chose A over B and D over C, you're, you're violating expected utility theory. You should have chosen, you know, um, for example, B over A and D over C. You could also choose A over B and um, C over D. Okay, you could be indifferent between all of them. But if you choose A over B and D over C, you are violating expected utility theory. Let's see why. Okay, what we oftentimes like to do in mathematical models is rearrange the terms so that they're more easily understood. And so remember that the first uh, set of gambles, A, was 100% um, you were certain of getting a million, and gamble B was 10% you get 5 million, 89% you get 1 million, and 1 percent chance you get nothing. And for C, there's an 11% chance you get 1 million, and an 89% chance that you get zero. Uh, for D, it's a 10% chance you get 5 million, and a 90% chance you get zero. So if we rearrange the terms, so in this first case here, what we're going to do is instead of making it 100% times a million, we're going to make it 11% times a million, plus 
times a million. So that's still 100% times a million. Still has an expected value of a million. For B, and I'm just going to rearrange the terms a little bit. I had this as the last term. You'll notice that these two essentially can cancel because they're identical to both A and B. So what you're really choosing, and this, this has nothing to do, you know, this is a 1% um, chance of receiving nothing. So you're really choosing between an 11% chance of receiving a million and a 10% chance of receiving 5 million. Okay, if we go to the second set of gambles, again, we're going to rearrange those terms a little bit. And here, gamble C is 11% chance of receiving a million, and it was already an 89% chance of receiving nothing. But gamble D was a 10% chance of receiving 5 million and a 90% chance of receiving zero. We're going to write that as a 1% chance of receiving zero and an 89% chance of receiving zero. So we can cancel these two. And again, this one is irrelevant because it's a 1% chance of receiving nothing. So basically, your choices here are, in gamble C, you have an 11% chance of receiving a million and a 10% chance of receiving 5 million. In the previous example, people were more interested in D over C, but over here, the gambles are the same. It's an 11% chance of 1 million compared to a 10% chance of 5 million. Here, people chose A over B. So there's some inconsistency here. I mean, is it that people behave irrationally? Well, let's ask ourselves why the paradox. Well, one explanation would come from behavioral finance or behavioral economics. Um, where a lot of times we argue that framing is a problem. How the problem is framed can oftentimes determine how participants choose. Okay? A and B and C and D were framed a little differently. And as we you know, did that manipulation in the previous slide, you saw that we eliminated that confusion. And if you, you know, most people have taken surveys, and when you've taken a survey, have you ever noticed that it seems like oftentimes they will ask the same question three or four or five times? Okay, but why do they do that? Oftentimes they frame the question slightly differently to make sure that you're consistent in your response. And in behavioral finance, again, the idea is, is that people sometimes get confused by the framing of a problem. And there are all kinds of examples here. Um, people behave differently when they hear that there's an 80%, you know, for, let's say, um, going through a surgical procedure. You know, if someone tells them there's a 90% chance of success and a 10% chance of failure, they behave differently than if they hear about the 10% chance of failure. Um, even though mathematically 90% chance of success is the same as 10% chance of failure, they behave differently. Um, another explanation that uh, critics would have, people who are critics of uh, behavioral finance theory or people who support expected utility theory might say that subjects may not behave the same in an experiment as they would in the real world. I mean, if you think about it, you know, in the real world, you actually think about these issues because you're actually, you know, making a choice that can make a difference in your life. You know, here in many university settings, oftentimes um, in psychology classes or in economics classes, if a professor needs participants in order to collect data, you know, he or she will require that they participate in a number of experiments uh, during the semester. So they have to sign up for two or three of these. And, you know, some of these students may not really care. They show up. They sign their name, so they get credit for it, and they just make a quick decision. They don't want to waste any time thinking about it. They got their, they got their uh, class credit, and they just leave. You know? Or, in some cases, participants are paid. They might be paid $10 or $15, but they get the same amount whether they make rational choices or irrational choices. So, again, they show up. They, they you know, make a quick calculation in their head. They don't spend any time thinking about it, and they get their 10 bucks and they leave. Again, in the real world, they might think more carefully about the decision. But, you know, 
it's hard to know whether people will partic will um, behave the same or will behave rationally if more money is on the line. Okay, a lot of people feel that, you know what, if if your life depended on it or it would make a difference in your life, you know, earning a million dollars or, you know, earning 500000 you'd actually spend some time thinking about it. We're here, you just go in, slap down an answer, and leave. But anyhow, this is the uh, well-known Allay paradox, and again, it contradicts uh, expected utility theory, which um, for classical economists who believe in expected utility theory, um, you know, shows some irrationality.